dispositions de l'article 240 du Code pénal ainsi que des dispositions des articles 552 et suivant du Code du numérique qui sont suffisamment restrictives de la liberté d'expression, de réunion et de manifestation. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you for your statement on the situation in uh, Benin uh, and also on your call for expanding and deepening the uh, dialogue uh, with the participation of all stakeholders uh, and parties uh, and also uh, the call for investigation uh, into uh, the shooting that happened in early May uh, 2019. We now have uh, Dola Omar Institute uh, of the University of Western Cape. Do we have a representative of Dola Omar Institute? Thank you. You have four minutes. Your Excellencies, Honorable Chairperson of the African Commission, distinguished guests, all protocol observed. The Dula Omar Institute, based at the University of the Western Cape, is committed to the promotion and protection of human and people's rights in Africa through rigorous research, policy intervention, and advocacy. This year, the Institute marks 29 years of its existence. Today, this joint statement by the Dula Umar Institute, together with its coalition partners, Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS, and the Initiative for Strategic, Strategic Litigation, will highlight on the role of states and national human rights institutions in eliminating sexual harassment and advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights in Africa. Sexual harassment amounts to the violation of women's fundamental rights and the freedoms recognized in international and regional human rights instruments. In particular, it undermines the right to sexual and reproductive health of women and constitutes an act of discrimination against women. It often violates rights such as dignity, liberty, security of persons, and freedom of discrimination. Women who suffer sexual harassment often do not have the requisite access to sexual and reproductive health services, including psychosocial services and legal remedies. Honorable Chair, in many African societies, sexual harassment is often reinforced by patriarchy and power imbalance. Women who are vulnerable and marginalized in society are more susceptible to sexual harassment. These may include, but not limited, to domestic workers, women living with HIV, migrant women, and women in academic institutions. Sexual harassment can place in different settings, such as homes, hospitals, and academic institutions, and parliament offices. Vulnerable workers face physical, verbal, and nonverbal forms of sexual harassment. Due to their economic vulnerability, there is often no clear way of vulnerable workers to seek redress. A recent documentary by the Britain Broadcasting Corporation on marks for sex for marks in institutions of higher education in some West African countries merely reinforces the, the pervasiveness of sexual harassment and the need to adopt a holistic approach to combating it. Recent movements have catapulted sexual harassment back to the forefront of thoughts on actionable and compensable discrimination. However, in many jurisdictions, the struggles to find a sustainable definition of harassment and to clearly articulate the ways in which sexual harassment amounts to discrimination persist. Further, national legal and policy frameworks are not only weak in defining sexual harassment, but are also deficient in eliminating the phenomenon through the criminal justice system and human rights and protection framework. Honorable Chair, in 2017, the African Commission adopted the guidelines for combating sexual violence and its consequences in Africa. More importantly, the guidelines call on states to adopt appropriate policies and laws with a view of addressing all forms of sexual violence against women. They further recognize the forms of sexual violence against women. The recent adopted International Labour Organization Convention 190 on Violence and Sexual Harassment has been described as radical and progressive. The convention emphasizes that violence and harassment is unacceptable and incompatible with decent work and a violation of human rights. Honorable Chair, 
Despite these norms and standards, gender-based violence, especially sexual harassment, remains a main concern. Many African states have failed to adopt laws and policies to combat gender-based violence, including sexual harassment. Eradicating gender-based violence, including sexual harassment, is the responsibility of all. Nonetheless, national human rights protection structures, such as national human rights... Your time is up. Uh, let me conclude with the last sentence. Integrated, um, we further recommend the African Commission to call on the national human rights institutions to integrate gender sensitive training of judicial and law enforcement officers and other public officials to increase the reporting of sexual harassment and all forms of gender-based violence and address the subsequent stigmatization and re-victimization um, re of survivors. We wishing you a fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dula Omer Institute, uh, particularly for uh, paying particular attention to the phenomena of sexual harassment and its prevalence uh, in various spaces of public life, including uh, in workspaces, uh, higher education institutions, um, on public transportation, uh, as well as on the road. Um, and the issues that you have highlighted in respect to sexual and reproductive health of uh, women and the need for reinforcing uh, measures by states and various sectors of society uh, to uh, protect uh, women and girls against sexual harassment. Uh, and also, I think the important point that you made about the need for national human rights institutions to conduct training uh, targeting in particular um, law enforcement agencies, including the judiciary. Thank you for that. I have received a request from the Arab Republic of Egypt uh, to exercise a right of reply. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, I'm taking the floor to uh, an exercise of the right of reply to uh, a notorious organization that keeps appearing before this commission called International Lawyers Organization. Uh, this organization claimed uh, that uh, during its statement today before the commission that um, organizations, including hers, were prevented from participating in uh, the commission's session in Sharm el Sheikh last April and May. Uh, to tell you the truth, it's very ironic because the, this person representing the organization, she's Egyptian. She doesn't need a visa to enter the country. So how come that she was prevented from entering the country? It's, it's a blatant lie, Mr. Chairperson, and I'm, I'm very sorry to, that this organization with the same representative keeps appearing before this commission each session and then they keep coming up with these blatant lies and it's, it's, it's a really a shame and maybe it's something that the, the commission needs to uh, consider about the credibility of the organizations that are uh, speaking uh, before it and have um, the right to speak before it. The, uh, she also uh, mentioned that uh, there are no civil society organizations in Egypt. Again, uh, Mr. Chairperson, you've been, the commission has been in Egypt, you've listened to uh, Egyptian civil society who participated in the commission's session in Sharm el-Sheikh. There are over 50,000 uh, non-governmental organizations operating in Egypt, about 30,000 of them alone are working with the EU funded by uh, you know, and, um, implementing projects funded by the EU uh, and the US and other international partners. So again, another blatant lie. The, uh, the organization also mentioned that uh, the, uh, there were uh, appeals by the, uh, the commission regarding uh, the executions uh, that took place uh, after final verdicts uh, regarding a number of uh, terrorist um, 
persons who belong to the uh, terrorist organization called Muslim Brotherhood. And that uh, Egypt unfortunately showed disrespect to the uh, com commission uh, because they didn't, uh, we didn't uh, adhere to the calls, the frequent calls by the uh, commission to, uh, to put an end to the executions and, and, uh, and the death penalty. Well, as you are well aware, this is something that we've been uh, talking about for so long. The issue of the abolition of the death penalty is a long uh, debate. It's uh, the um, recommendations uh, that came out from this commission about the abolition or placing a moratorium on the death penalty. These are all well-respected recommendations that need to go through um, a democratic dialogue within the country itself in order to decide whether or not it is suitable for the society or not. We cannot in Egypt impose a moratorium or eliminate, uh, abolish the death penalty without consulting the people in a public referendum. Throughout the world, all the countries that have actually um, imposed uh, a, uh, an abolition or a moratorium on the death penalty, the, the decisions came from above, not in a democratic way, Mr. President, Mr. Chairperson. The only uh, if you consider, for example, public opinion polls in the UK, 56% of the population wants the reimposition of the death penalty. 54% wants the reinstatement of the death penalty in France. So are these decisions taken by the governments representative of the will of the people? Is this democracy? We don't think so. What we are looking for in Egypt is to have a decision um, an enlightened decision by the public. We are happy to have a debate, but then it, the final decision would be only to the people or by the people themselves. One last thing, the terrorists who kill in cold blood people who are praying in churches and mosques, they, they one, these people cannot have mercy these people, they didn't show mercy towards hundreds of people that they've killed. There's one person, for example, who killed in three incidents 50 people, unarmed people. This person did it in three different instances until he was arrested by the police and then after a fair trial he was executed. So if you tell me that this person maybe did it, you know, and he was out of his mind in the first time or whatever, that might be understandable. But he did it three different incidents and 50 people. Where are the rights of the victims? Where are the rights of the families of the victims? Mr. Chairperson, to end, the debate on the death penalty is a long one. And I don't think that uh, this could be solved within this commission. It's only for us in Egypt, it's only going to be through your democratic time, process, your a referendum minutes, where the people say their uh, five final say. Thank up. you. Thank you. Thank you, Egypt, for exercising your right of reply. We now have uh, an institution, uh, an NGO, uh, who would like to make a statement, uh, AFCF with registration number 333. I don't see any. Uh, Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa. You have the floor. Four minutes. Thank you. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Commissioner, State Delegates, ladies and gentlemen. This is a joint statement from the Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa and our partners, the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. We take this opportunity to congratulate the new chairperson and vice chairperson of the commission and wish them all the best as they steer the leadership of the commission for the next two years. During the 61st ordinary session of the commission in November 2017, IHRDA expressed concern at the attacks on civic space, particularly the freedom of association in several African states. 
We wish to convey to the Commission our continuing concern and alarm at the continued shrinking of civic spaces in many African countries. Many countries on the continent are finding ways to limit the rights to freedom of assembly, association, expression and access to information guaranteed under the African Charter. A growing trend is the use of cybersecurity laws to unduly limit the freedom of expression and access to information as guaranteed under the Charter. In Nigeria, several journalists and civil society activists have been arrested under the Cybercrimes Prohibition and Prevention Act of 2015 for statements that were well within their rights to freedom of expression. Recently, journalist and political activist Omo Yele Showere was charged with making statements in media interviews that were insulting to the president of Nigeria. Another journalist, Jones Abiri, has been in detention for periods of over two years and charged under the Cybercrimes Act because of a news report he published in the Weekly Source newspaper. Similar cybercrime laws exist and have been used to silence journalists and activists in Egypt, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. Several states have also used internet shutdowns to silence citizens' voices and quell dissent. During the last presidential elections in the DRC, the internet was caught while voters were waiting for election results. The government justified the internet courts by saying the shutdown was necessary to curb rumor mongering among citizens. This was the second time the country's government decided to block the internet. In January 2018, the state caught the internet in anticipation of planned protests where citizens were requesting President Kabila to vacate his position. The government of Chad has shut down access to all social media since March 2018. This is the second time the government will resort to this tactic. In 2016, the government shut down access to the internet for eight months. On January 15, 2019, the government of Zimbabwe shut down social media, including WhatsApp, and eventually completely shut down internet access in response to growing protests against the rise in fuel prices. Internet shutdowns have also been employed by governments in Togo, Cameroon, Benin, Gabon, and Sudan. Public order laws are being used to curtail the rights of persons to freedom of assembly in states such as the Gambia and Sierra Leone, among others. These laws contain provisions that necessitate the grant of permission by state agents before protests or demonstrations can take place. Demonstrations that take place without this permission are deemed illegal and can be dispersed, in most cases with the use of excessive force. This is in addition to criminal sanctions for those taking part in the protests. In Uganda, the Public Order Management Act of 2013 requires prior notification for protests, but the government now interprets this as a requirement for prior authorization. Just this year in the Gambia, the provisions of the Public Order Act of 1965 have been used to deny many activists of the right to protest, and a number of peaceful protests have been forcefully dispersed, with persons taking part in these protests arrested. In Sierra Leone, Activists have been arrested and detained for taking part in peaceful protests. One of them, Edmond Abu, was arrested and later released last year while participating in a peaceful protest about an increase in fuel prices. These incidents are only illustrative of a general trend in many African countries. We therefore urge the Commission to respond to cases of shrinking space in Africa wherever and whenever they happen. Call on African states to respect and protect the rights to expression access to information, assembly, and association for everyone within their jurisdictions. Call on African states to bring their cyber crime and public order laws in compliance with the provisions of Articles 9 and 11 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And lastly, we urge the Commission to continue to popularize the Commission's guidelines on freedom of association and assembly in Africa, the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, and the Commission's guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, IHRDA, for uh, your statement, uh, focusing on challenge uh, facing uh, civic space uh, in Africa, um, particularly on account of the use of uh, various laws, including uh, cyber crimes uh, prevention laws, as well as public order uh, laws, and uh, shutdown of uh, the internet. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Center for Reproductive Rights. 
I don't see the representative of Center for Reproductive Rights. Ensemble contre la paix de droit. Maybe I didn't read it well. So Nicolas Perrault. Ensemble, ensemble. Ensemble contre la peine de mort. Together against the death penalty. Okay, I don't see uh, anyone. Uh, the next one is OMUNGA. No. K E L I H. Which institution do you represent? Omunga. Okay. Please proceed. Four minutes. Okay. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente da Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos. Es meus senhores comissários, representantes dos Estados, dos órgãos da União Africana, de organizações intergovernamentais e internacionais, das instituições nacionais de direitos humanos e das ONGs, as nossas saudações. Senhor Presidente, a Associação Omunga reconhece o esforço do Executivo angolano, principalmente na pessoa do Presidente da República de Angola, no sentido de se criar um ambiente favorável para a promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos em Angola. Prova disso, a discussão pública sobre, eh, sobre a Estratégia Nacional para os Direitos Humanos, a existência de nova política migratória no país, que visa dar maior dignidade aos imigrantes, refugiados e requerentes de asilo de asilo. Prova a aprovação da lei número 13, barra 19, novo regime jurídico dos estrangeiros em Angola, que despenaliza a migração em Angola, ainda, a, a, ainda podemos realçar aqui a lei 10, barra 15, que regula o estatuto dos refugiados e requerentes de asilo. No entanto, tais avanços não se refletem no dia a dia dos imigrantes refugiados e requerentes de asilo em Angola, com realce aos africanos. Continuamos ainda a assistir prisões ilegais contra imigrantes e, 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 contra imigrantes, e grande parte dos mesmos são encaminhados para o centro de, de trânsito com acesso bastante limitado aos seus familiares e amigos e por vezes até proibidos de receber qualquer tipo de suplemento. Relativamente ao repatriamento dos refugiados e imigrantes, e, e importa dizer que, ao contrário do afirmado no recente balanço feito pelo Executivo eh, relativamente à Operação Transparência e Resgate, o Estado angolano tem, na grande maioria dos casos, imputado as despesas do repatriamento dos próprios imigrantes. É válido questionar o destino dado às verbas alocadas para a materialização e efetivação da intenção. Em 2009, o Alto Comissariado das Nações Unidas para os Refugiados declarou o fim do Estatuto de, de, de Refugiado aos Cidadãos Ruandeses, eh, Serra Leoa e Libéria. No entanto, até o momento, o Estado angolano não se pronunciou relativamente ao assunto, considerando que muitos destes cidadãos residem eh, no país há mais de 10 anos e têm constantemente clamado pela sua integração. O Estado angolano, ao optar por esta postura, contribui para o aumento do número de cidadãos apátrida, do mesmo modo, aumenta o número de cidadãos nascidos em Angola, filhos de pais estrangeiros, que após completar 18 anos de idade, encontram grandes dificuldades na aquisição da nacionalidade. Recentemente, o Estado angolano manifestou a intenção de adotar a Convenção sobre a, sobre a Pátria. Por esta razão, apelamos à Comissão no sentido de estabelecer o diálogo com as autoridades angolanas que eh, a sua ratificação seja efetiva. Triste exemplo desta, eh, desta negligência é o caso do cidadão serralionense Abu Bakar Kabá, que reside em Angola desde o ano de 1990, que viu recusada 
pelo Serviço de Imigração Estrangeiro, em missão do documento que lhe permite buscar tratamento médico no estrangeiro. Apesar, do apesar da recomendação dos médicos que acompanham a sua doença, estando o mesmo há mais de cinco meses à espera de uma resposta das autoridades. A ausência de uma estratégia e de ações concreta por parte, do, por parte das autoridades angolanas tem constituído um entrave para, para garantir e facilitar o acesso à documentação dos imigrantes e refugiados. Assim, a Associação Omonga apela à Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos no sentido de encetar um diálogo permanente com as autoridades angolanas para que os direitos desta, desta franja sejam respeitados, protegidos e garantidos, bem como a ratificação da Convenção Internacional para a Proteção dos Direitos dos Trabalhadores Migrantes e Membros de Suas Famílias seja uma realidade. Senhor Presidente, para terminar, gostaria de convidar os representantes dos Estados africanos, corpos diplomáticos aqui representados, organizações internacionais, ONGs, na construção de uma comunidade global baseada na solidariedade, onde a autonomia dos Estados seja o garante de um respeito pela dignidade humana e dos direitos humanos. Somos todos imigrantes. Obrigado. Thank you very much, uh, Munga, uh, for that statement, uh, echoing that we are all migrants and highlighting the plight that uh, migrants uh, face in, 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 in Angola. Um, and also the issues arise uh, from statelessness. Uh, do we have a representative of KLIH? Next, I see Nigeria, uh, I think, uh, seeking to exercise the right of reply. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity for, to, to uh, exercise the right of respo uh, response to this uh, statement made by this NGO, uh, National, what is the name of the you know, Institute of Human Rights and uh, Development in Africa. It made mention of uh, the arrest of uh, some people in Nigeria uh, for expressing their opinion or views and that it goes against the freedom of expression in Africa. That is not the truth. <laughs> they actually bending lies and, you know, half truth before the commission here. So Ero was arrested for leading a, um, a, a revolution now protest. And uh, he, he stood in for the last election as a result candidate. Suddenly after he lost the election, he now organized people to do uh, it, 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 it lead the, 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 the revolution. Government was concerned about it. He was arrested. And he, he standing trial. He had been granted bill for the past three weeks. He couldn't perfect his bill. He has gone back to the court to vary the, 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 the bill conditions. The court has granted this. And uh, he has not been able to meet the bill conditions. Nobody is ready to sort his, uh, his bill conditions. So we are surprised and not tell the facts as they are. It's not because he was expressing his opinion. So we just want to put that on record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nigeria. Uh, I also recognize Angola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would like just to congratulate my brothers who have been come all the way from Angola to Banjul to state this. I just raised my question to invite them to make it clear they don't need to travel all along to stay, make such a statement. We are waiting for them and we are very open 
to receive their statements and all their comments through the human rights institutions and the forum of civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Angola. Um, I, I recognize uh, Burkina Faso. Monsieur le Président, Honorable Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs, la délégation de Burkina Faso voudrait ici réagir à la déclaration faite par le mouvement burkinabé des droits de l'homme et des peuples MBDHP à la suite du panel sur les exécutions extrajudiciaires. En effet, Monsieur le Président, le MBDHP fait porter aux forces de défense et de sécurité FDS les responsabilités d'exécution extrajudiciaire dans certains Faso. Je voudrais rappeler que les FDS sont des forces républicaines chargées de défendre le territoire et protéger toutes les populations. Elles s'y emploient avec beaucoup de professionnalisme à la limite de leurs moyens. Laisser croire que les FDS pourraient se retourner contre les populations civiles fait partie des stratégies des terroristes dont les ambitions sont justement de créer cet amalgame. L'exemple des cinq anciens tués à Maïtagou dans la commune de Komianga le 26 avril 2019, en plein jour, devant leurs élèves, n'a été possible que parce que les terroristes étaient revêtus de la tenue des forces armées nationales. Pour ce qui est des allégations de stigmatisation des peuples pouvant engendrer des conflits intercommunautaires, il est à relever que les peuples vivent en parfaite harmonie avec les autres composantes de la population sur l'ensemble du territoire et ne sont nullement inquiétés. Les cas isolés d'affrontements intercommunautaires dont Yurgu dans la région du centre-nord ont donné lieu à des enquêtes judiciaires et des personnes présumées auteurs de tueries ont été mises aux arrêts. Enfin, dans un contexte d'insécurité, des personnes isolées peuvent profiter de la situation et assouvir leur volonté de vengeance ou simplement régler leur compte. Le cas du secrétaire général de l'Alliance Police Nationale, qui aurait été victime de tentatives d'assassinat il y a quatre jours de cela, entre probablement dans ce cadre. D'ailleurs, une enquête est immédiatement ouverte pour faire la lumière sur cette affaire. En conclusion, le gouvernement du Burkina Faso prend toutes les mesures nécessaires pour protéger la vie de toutes les personnes vivant sur son territoire, qui méritent d'ailleurs toutes cette protection. Au regard des efforts consentis, Monsieur le Président, il faut même féliciter le gouvernement du Burkina Faso et je vous remercie. Thank you, uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, we now uh, call on Amnesty International to make a statement. Thank you. You have four minutes. Honorable Chairperson and Commissioners, on this occasion of the 65th Ordinary Session of the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights, Amnesty International is pleased to announce that it has introduced a new annual report on the state of African regional human rights bodies and mechanisms. This report is intended to serve as an annual review of the state and performance of the three regional human rights bodies in Africa. To strengthen the African human rights system, it is critical to track, document, and understand how the regional human rights bodies operate, what they achieve in practice, and the challenges they face. This new report is in line with our strategic goal to enforce and strengthen international and regional human rights system and inspired by our long-standing work in Africa. Honorable Chairperson, the State of African Regional Human Rights Bodies and Mechanisms will be published every 21st October in commemoration of the entry into force of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. On this day in 1986, the inauguration edition of the report covering the period from January 2018 to June 2019 was launched this past, this past 
Monday 21st, uh, 21st here in Banjul and on the margins of this session. The findings of recommendation of the report cuts across all the major functions and activities of the Africa Commission. Amnesty International hopes that all African, that the African Commission will find the report particularly valuable as it comes at a time when the African Commission is in the process of revising its rules of procedures and as its current strategic plan is nearing its end. Honorable Chairperson, the report finds that despite facing many stubborn challenges, the Africa Commission registered a relatively impressive record during the reporting period in the execution of its mandate relating to state reporting, standard setting, and intervening in urgent situations. However, the African Commission's communications procedure faces a chronic challenge, the slow pace of determining communications leading to a perennial backlog of its docket, in its docket. The number of communications pending before the African Commission has increased more than twofold in the last five years, from 87 pending communications in May 2014 to 240 in May 2019. In percentage terms, this is a 175% increase. Our analysis shows that the communications procedures, procedure seems to be working at its bare minimum. Only a few number of communications are being cleared out of the African Commission's docket. Between January 2018 and June 2019, the African Commission issued on only three decisions on the merits and four on admissibility. Honorable Chairperson, there is an urgent need to firmly and decisively deal with the problem of the high number of pending communications, a problem that the African Commission has itself acknowledged for long. In this regard, Amnesty International proposes the following. One, as a matter of urgency, the Africa Commission should develop a backlog reduction plan to be shared with all relevant actors, including the public. This plan should put emphasis on individuals' right to have their causes heard within reasonable time, speedy determination of communication, and strict adherence to time limits by parties, especially states. And two, as every member of the Africa Commission serves as a rapporteur for a certain number of communications, each of them should include in the activity reports a section in which they outline the progress they have made in handling the pending communications in their respective dockets. Your time is up. One just one sentence. Amnesty International stands ready to partner and work with the African Commission to implement these and other recommendations contained in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Amnesty International. For um, looking into the performance of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and also for particularly recommendations on the communications procedure of the Commission, uh, including the recommendation for uh, members of the Commission to include in their activity report uh, the progress relating to the countries for which they are responsible. Thank you for that. Uh, the next is... Can you switch off that mic, please? Thank you. What is this? Society Study Center. So, Society's Study Center. You have the floor. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, allow me to congratulate you as uh, Chairperson and Vice Chair for, uh, for a new cycle. We hope you lead a constructive dialogue with all stakeholders. Honorable Chairperson, we would like to congratulate the people of Sudan on the success of the peaceful revolution that led to transitional civilian government 
to achieve the slogans of revolutions, revolution, freedoms, peace, and justice by realizing full democracy, sustainable peace, guarantees the freedoms, respect of human rights. Secondly, we highly appreciate the great efforts that has been exerted by the Transitional Military Council and Change and Freedom Forces to, in order to agree on the constitutional uh, document and political declaration that defined the future and the period of the transitional period in Sudan. In this regard, my organization highly appreciate the African efforts represented by the mediation of the African Union and the government of Ethiopia in reaching an agreement on the constitutional document. Honorable Chairperson, allow me to share with you, uh, with your esteemed council, some positive development and indicators in the human rights situation in Sudan in the post-revolution period, which are as follows. First, we strongly welcome the constitutional document which give the priority to peace and the human rights in Sudan with a special focus on the right of women and children which gives the women more than 40 percent of the legislative council seats. Also the constitutional document approved the establishment of a specialized commission related to the human rights including the Transitional Justice Commission and Electoral Commission. Third, in order to stop the wars and achieve the slogans of the revolution, the transitional government signed a declaration of principles and ceasefire declaration with the armed movement in Juba in this week. We hope it will lead to sustainable peace in Sudan. Four, in order to achieve the rule of law and in the impunity in Sudan, a chief justice and attorney general have been appointed. Five, we is, uh, highly appreciate an agreement has been signed between the transitional government and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on 25 September to open a country office of the High Commissioner in Sudan with the full mandate. This is step will promote and protect the human rights situation in Sudan besides its role in building Sudanese capacities in the field of human rights as well as providing the right information about the reality of the situation in Sudan. Six, renaming and restructuring the National Intelligence and Security Service to become the General Intelligence Service with the limited mandate and just to gathering and analysis of information. Information. Seven, the formation and naming an independent investigation committee in last week to uh, investigate on the event of the dispersing protester in sit in before the Army General Headquarters. Honorable Chairperson, we are optimistic that the near future will be will have a profound Im impact on the improving the human rights situation in Sudan, particularly with the ongoing efforts of peace and implementation of constitutional document, which your gave time, the huge is space and, and consideration uh, for promotion and protection of human rights in Sudan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, positive uh, statement highlighting many of the good uh, and encouraging developments in Sudan, uh, putting the country and the people of Sudan on a path to uh, democratization, uh, respect for human rights, reconciliation, and justice, um, including uh, the many important uh, institutional mechanisms that are contained in the constitutional declaration uh, such as the transitional justice commission the electoral commission and the prioritization of human rights and peace and the initiative for achieving peace uh, in sudan as well as the review of the security sector uh, in sudan uh, and importantly of course this commission welcomes the establishment of the investigation committee 
uh, an independent investigation committee to look into the events of 3 June 2019. Thank you again. Uh, the next one is Human Rights Institute of South Africa. Thank you. You have four minutes. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. All protocol observed. First and foremost, on behalf of Human Rights Institute of South Africa, we express our gratitude and appreciation to Commissioner Maiga, the outgoing chairperson of the Commission and Vice Chairperson Commissioner Mute for their excellent leadership. We also wish to congratulate you, Chairperson, and uh, your Vice Chairperson, and we look forward to working with you. Hurisa commends the African Union for declaring 2019 as a year of refugee returnees and internally displaced persons to mark its 50th um, anniversary on the AU Convention and its uh, 10th anniversary of the Kampala Convention on IDPs. While we appreciate the noble intention of this theme, we are concerned, Chairperson, that in the 50 years of this AU Convention, the reporting mechanism under Article 7 of the Convention are ineffective. In South Africa, we noted with much disappointment the reoccurrence of xenophobia. We are, however, encouraged by the South Africa State uh, Representative confirming to the Commission that the government of South Africa acknowledges the persistence of xenophobia and the country's commitment to addressing this problem and uh, opening um, and welcoming the Commission for assistance. Regarding the state of human rights and democracy in other parts of SADC uh, region, we are concerned about the continuous conflict, um, uh, continuous closed spaces through the development of uh, draconian laws uh, that impede uh, the functioning um, of associations, particularly to human rights uh, defenders who are restricted in the running of their operations, uh, including surveillance, death threats, constitutional amendments, and imposing NGO bills that are intended to interfere with NGO government structures, funding models, and programs. Tanzania, Zambia, DRC, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique have continued to be places of fear and risk of life of defending um, human rights uh, activists. For example, in August uh, 2019 in Tanzania, some participants at the SADC CSO forum were intimidated, harassed, and searched in, retali in, in retaliation for acting uh, in sol solidarity with people of South Africa in the annual commemoration of the Marikana massacre. In Zimbabwe, reprisals, extrajudicial killings, forced disappearances, beatings, arbitrary arrest, and shutdown of internet attribute negatively to the crippling economy and political in instability in the country. Uh, lastly, Chairperson, in Botswana, we are concerned about the forced repatriation of the people of Namibia that left over 800 families forcefully repatriated without offering them an opportunity uh, to state their cases. Honorable Chair, as I conclude, um, we therefore call on the Commission to uh, encourage the AU member states to imp improve reporting mechanisms on the AU uh, Refugee and Kampala Convention for the Commission to enhance implementation of Article 12 of the African Charter, uh, for South Africa to find sustainable solutions and end xenophobia, discrimination and intolerance through the implementation of um, Resolution 131 and um, 304. And um, for the development of progressive laws for security of the internet to prevent arbitrary internet shutdowns and uh, citizens' privacy, and for the SADC to implement uh, freedom of, of movement uh, of the people in the region. And finally, we encourage member states uh, to comply with the regional obligations and commissions uh, uh, rules and procedures. Uh, Chairperson, uh, we really thank you very much uh, for providing us the opportunity to present this statement to the Commission. Thank you. Thank you for the observations relating to uh, uh, the ineffectiveness uh, of the reporting mechanisms on the OU Refugee Convention, uh, the issues that you have highlighted uh, relating to freedom of as uh, association and, and assembly, uh, an issue that has been uh, a recurring theme uh, of the past uh, several days, 
uh, and also uh, the various challenges that you have highlighted, uh, including uh, the uh, uh, forced repatriation, uh, and then uh, for which the Commission has adopted, as you know, a uh, general comment under Article 12, and we do hope that uh, there is an opportunity for following that up. Um, and uh, we would like to reiterate uh, and draw the attention of uh, all delegates uh, to uh, make use of uh, the guidelines on freedom of association and assembly uh, that this Commission has adopted uh, to help uh, regulate uh, freedom of assembly and association in compliance with uh, the need for respecting uh, the fundamental uh, freedoms and, and rights contained uh, in these, in these uh, rights. Uh, the next one is uh, International Wor Working Group for Indigenous Affairs. Yugia? Anyone? No? Uh, African Center for treatment and rehabilitation of torture victims. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. We thank uh, Uganda for continuously engaging uh, civil society organizations in the make, report making processes and capacity building initiatives for torture prevention and accountability. However, Uganda is yet to fully have a comprehensive national statistic information and disaggregated data for torture survivors in compliance with, in compliance with uh, the general comment uh, number four of the African Charter on the right to rehabilitation. The Public Order Management Act continues to be abused due to misinterpretation and lack of interpretation section. We thank Uganda for passing the Mental Health Treatment Act of 2018. However, maintenance of ECT, seclusion, isolation as methods of treatment affects the non-derogability of the freedom from torture in Uganda. SCTV applauds Uganda for her commitment towards hosting refugee communities, IDPs, returnees. For instance, in the first half of 2018, Uganda hosted 37,000 refugees from Somalia, 96,170 from DRC, 42,660 from Burundi, and 1,066,000 from South Sudan, among others. We thank UNHCR for the strategic directions of 2017-2021, we wish they would popularize them. SCTV continues to include socioeconomic support for refugees, but we can do so much due to limited resources. In 2018, SCTV both registered and treated 1,070 new survivors of torture, 941 from Uganda, 110 from DRC, six from Somalia, four from Burundi, three from Rwanda, one from Pakistan, three from Angola, and two from South Sudan. In terms of gender disaggregation, 317 were female, 753 male. The security forces continue to be the highest perpetrators of torture, with the Uganda police have been registered with 327 cases, compared to the 380 cases reported to the, about them in 2017. The UPDF came second with 257 cases reported in 2018, compared to the 57 cases reported in 2017. The youth continue suffering more acts of torture compared to other categories. Challenges specific to refugees, IDPs, asylum seekers, and returnees. Resettlement and integration question. Due to the social economic challenges and high costs of living, this creates a uh, space for refugees are committing petty crimes, especially the urban refugees, leading to their arrest. However, accessibility to these places of detention become, becomes a challenge because it is only the Uganda Human Rights Commission which has unlimited access to all places of detention. The witness protection law. Uganda has not yet passed a witness protection law 
and it is only a bill since 2014. The general challenges, untimely compensation to survivors of torture, still persist. The other one is uh, treatment and rehabilitation of survivors is yet to be mainstreamed across state health institutions. And the other one is the glaring conflict between medical and human rights approaches depicted in the provisions that provide for seclusion, isolation, ECT, mechanical bodily restraint, as, as whether they are methods of treatment or forms of psychological torture as classified under the second shade of the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act Number 3 of 2012. Lastly, the recommendations to the African Commission. We urge the Commission to require, to, to require Uganda to quicken up the process of ratifying the optional protocol, the Convention Against Torture of 2006. In, also, we urge the Commission to request Uganda to mainstream rehabilitation services across all state institutions for torture survivors. To the state of Uganda, we urge Uganda to ratify the optional protocol. We also urge the Ministry of Finance to fast track, lastly, we urge the Ministry of Finance to fast track receipt of compensatory awards ordered for torture survivors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pan-African Lawyers Union, PALU. You have four minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. The Pan-African Lawyers Union congratulates uh, you, Mr. Chairperson, on your new appointment. In the interest of time, Palu has three main comments. The first being with regard to the review of the Benjamin Declaration and Platform of Action of 1995. We remind the Commission that in the course of last year, 2018, based on the impassioned cries of women and men working for the African Union at its headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Chairperson of the AU Commission commissioned an inquiry into questions of sexual harassment, staff intimidation, nepotism, and sex for jobs at the AU. Whereas a report was ultimately issued, which has not been widely circulated and discussed, the process seems to have been rendered into oblivion. We urge the Commission to take this opportunity to practically engage the AU Commission and other AU organs and institutions to breathe life into this very African Me Too moment, and to engender systematic reforms and a sustainable culture, cultural change at the AU, because Mr. Chairperson will believe that the AU cannot give to its citizens what it cannot give to itself. Secondly, with regards to the discussion on civic space and citizen participation in the 2030 and 2063 agenda, we congratulate the Commission for the significant work that it has done to promote and protect African citizens' rights, freedom of expression, freedom of information, and assembly and association amidst a resurgence of onslaughts from many African governments. We commit to work more robustly with the Commission, with the rest of the EHRS leadership, African lawyers and African citizens on this issue. In this regard, we would request to come back at a later time, bringing together the elected leaders of the legal profession in the 55 African member states and the six regions of Africa to specifically engage the Commission on this issue and on the implementation of decisions and recommendations of the AHRS organs and institutions. We also specifically call upon the Commission to inquire into the threat and attack attacks recently reported in Uganda against human rights defenders, especially those advocating for the rights of LGBTQI+. Finally, Mr. Chairperson, with regard to the discussion on the Commission's study on conflict situations towards a more systematic and effective role of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, with relation to Burundi and Tanzania, in this year of refugees and returnees, we call upon the Commission and its mechanisms to investigate the credible allegations that Tanzanian authorities are pursuing Burundian refugees into returning to Burundi and to reinforce the message to the Tanzanian government to stop making threatening statements towards refugees, to publicly state that it will not coerce returnees and to protect refugees' rights in the camps. Regarding the case in Cameroon, several of our colleagues at the NGO Forum and at this session have spoken on the unacceptable political human rights and humanitarian crisis ongoing in the northwest and southwest of the Anglophone regions of Cameroon. Their statistics have been given by several colleagues, which I need not belabor. Mr. Chairperson, there are reasonable grounds to believe that the 
crimes against humanity have and continue to be committed since the beginning of this crisis in October 2016. There is evidence that much of this violence is intentional and planned, both by those using violence in the name of protesting oppression and by government security forces, mainly through attacks on villages, often followed by indiscriminate civilian killings. The entire gamut your time, of crisis... Your time is up. May I just finish on this? Your time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you. The next is Center for Human Rights and Rehabilitation. Four minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Center, I would like to um, report uh, some human rights issues that are happening in Malawi. Uh, and also I would like to state that uh, what I'm saying are facts. We have evidence on the ground and some of us who have lived uh, that experience uh, that I'm going to highlight in this uh, statement. Um, would want the Commission uh, to get attention on what is happening uh, in Malawi, specifically on the attacks against the human rights defenders uh, in Malawi. I have some specific uh, cases that have been going on uh, in Malawi. For example, on 11th October 2019, Mr. Timothy Tambo, who is the chairperson of the Human Rights Defenders Coalition, survived an assassination attempt when a known assailant suspected to be um, agent of the ruling uh, government uh, shot six live bullets uh, at his vehicle when he was uh, in that vehicle. Apart from this, when we are here, there was also another attack on Ms. Reverend McDonald Semereka, a member of the Human Rights uh, Defenders Coalition. That is on the 9th, on the 22nd of October, where some gunmen also shot at his uh, house. On 25th September, uh, Dr. Bire Mayaya was also assaulted by political party uh, agents in the full view uh, of the police. Up to now, uh, the perpetrators of these atrocities are not arrested, though there are clear videos uh, in terms of who committed uh, these offenses. Honorable Chair, I would like also to report that um, the police has also uh, been perpetrators of violence, specifically um, involving women. On 16th October, some police officers raped innocent uh, women in Lilongwe, the capital city of Malawi. As we are talking today, there is a demonstration uh, against uh, the rape cases that uh, the police officers uh, were involved in. What is more worrisome is that uh, the police itself uh, commissioned um, a commission to investigate itself. Uh, though we have been advocating uh, for the country to have an independent commission, complaint commission within the police uh, system. In the light of these cases, I would like to impress uh, the commission um, to urge Malawi to guarantee uh, protection of human rights defenders and their families uh, in Malawi. But also I would want um, the government uh, justice system to arrest those individuals who are perpetrators of this, this injustice. But also we would want our police service not to be politicized because uh, our police is operating as if it's uh, a political party organ. Of, of, of the current uh, ruling party. I thank you for your attention, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, your statement, uh, in particular focusing on the violence uh, that human rights defenders are facing in Malawi. Uh, legal assistance and uh, defense project.
Okay, I don't see representative of uh, this organization. You have four minutes. press for time. Can you please proceed with your statement? Honorable Chairperson, uh, my name is Martin Obono. I'm here to read the statement on behalf of our organization and um, the Nigerian, based on the Nigerian human rights situation. Um, Nigerian organizations in, uh, human rights organizations in Nigeria and uh, and defenders are concerned by the continued stifling of the press, um, erosion of fundamental rights, freedom of expression, and the failure of the Nigerian government to reform the criminal justice system in Nigeria. In recent times, documented reports show an, an, increase, an increasing trend in the arrest of journalists and the individuals found to share opinions contrary to stance of government of Nigeria or communications criticizing the, the government. In Nigeria, journalists risk prosecution under the restrictive laws, including the broadly worded Cyber Crimes Act. Blood bloggers were arrested under its provisions in 2016, but not one has been convicted since then. A Nigerian journalist, John Sabiri, is facing prosecution under the Act. He was held by the secret police without any charge for two years and was rearrested in 2019. Agba Jalingo, a journalist and publisher is currently in jail and facing allegations of treason after he published a story alleging diversion of 500 million naira by the Cross River State Governor. Abubakar Idris, popularly called Daddy Yatta, was forcefully taken from his home in Kaduna. His whereabouts still remain unknown. Although the Attorney General in a recent BBC interview was unable to deny that he wasn't held by state by in any of the state facilities. Recently, Fisai Osuyombo, a journalist, released an investigative report on the criminal justice system in Nigeria, documenting interactions with the Nigerian police, the courts, and the Nigerian correctional services, raising questions as to the competence and credibility of the criminal justice system in Nigeria. There is need for the commission's mechanism on prisons, con on prison conditions of detention and policing in Africa to look into the findings of this investigative report and request accountability from the relevant bodies in Nigeria. We therefore note that there are, co there are cogent issues raised in the investigative reports. These issues cannot be ignored as they are issues that per particularly affect, affect the poor women young persons and people vulnerable and vulnerable people because of their real or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity a corrupt criminal justice system subjects nigeria to arbitrary arrests illegal detention and on a, an, an erosion of their fundamental rights to fair hearing these issues deserve the urgent attention of the african commission on human and people's rights we further note that the Nigerian constitution guarantees freedom of expression and of its press, and the courts in recent years have issued rulings that expanded the legal protection for journalists. However, criminal and civil laws and civil laws punish various press and speech offenses, including sedition, criminal defamation, and the publication of false news. Impunity of those who commit crimes against journalists remains a problem. Your we time therefore is up. One more minute, sir, please. We Please therefore conclude. implore the Commission to invoke its protective mandate to call on the government of Nigeria to constitute an independent body to investigate the crucial claims contained in these investigative reports by FISAIO. The Nigerian government to release all journalists in its deten detention and cease to stifle the freedom of expression as enshrined in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The National Human R Rights Commission to investigate and address the arrest and unlawful detention of journalists in Nigeria. We thank you.
Thank you. Thank you to you all for uh, your statements. Um, we have concluded the list uh, that we have. Uh, I see uh, Uganda requesting for right of reply. You have the floor, please. Okay, I recognize the Gambia as well. Okay. Please. Um, thank you, Chair, for availing us the, the opportunity once again to respond to the issues that have been raised. Um, Chair, in uh, 2012, the government of Uganda enacted the Prevention and, and Prohibition of Torture Act, which provides for the crime of torture. This law has been praised for, among others, providing for criminal liability for both state actors and, individual, and individuals. Uganda has also recently passed the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Regulations that further provide for how the Act can be um, utilized, but also provide a complaint and investigation procedure. The Uganda Human Rights Commission and other independent human rights monitors, such as judicial officers, the Directorate of Public Prosecutions, the Justices of Peace, have full access to prison facilities under Sections 109 and 112 of the Prisons Act. Chair, to provide for civil society access to prisons, the Uganda Pol Prison Service has signed several memorandum of understanding with various organizations such as Foundation for Human Rights Initiative, SCT with the organization that made this statement, Penal Reform International, the African Prisons Project, and among others, Hurinate, to provide for them opportunities to inspect places of detention, as well as create awareness among the inmates. The judiciary and the UHRC continue to hold perpetrators of torture accountable in accordance with the law and have awarded victims of torture compensation for the violations of their rights. Chair, just to note that Uganda has finalized its report on the African Charter as well as the United Nations Convention Against Torture and will elaborate further on the cases of torture that have been handled as well as the awards that have been paid out to the victims in that report. I thank you, Chair. Oui, merci beaucoup. On passe à l'autre euh, droit de réponse. C'est quel pays La Gambie. La Gambie a la parole maintenant pour exercer son droit de réponse. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving us the floor on the right to respond. Um, for the first time we're having the floor, I would like to welcome the commissioners and all delegates here. To the wel welcome to the Gambia. Um, this is a response to regarding the public order for the right to protest. Mr. Chair, just to inform you that for the past one year, the Gambia, under the office of the IGP, has granted more than six parties the right to permit. Under the Constitution, sub such Section 25 on the Constitution, it, it gives the, Gambia, um, the citizens of the Gambia the right to demonstrate, with subject to requesting written, a written request to the office of the IGP, for their desire to protest. Under the same section, the same constitution, section 25, subsection F, it gives the party to go to the high court um, if, their, if their permit is denied. If the high court is not satisfied with the denial of, or the reasons for the IGP to deny the party the rights to demonstrate, then the courts will order the IGP to give the um, party the right to permit. 
uh, Mr. Chair, just to enlighten um, you a little bit, that the Gambia is on the healing process right now, but nonetheless, with the security, with security reasons that we do deny permits once in a while, but majority of the parties that request permits, they are granted in the Gambia, the right to demonstrate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I understand that there are uh, two um, uh, NGOs uh, that haven't made their statement. Uh, the first one is Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Are you here? The representative for Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Call by name, Angela. Angela. Okay. Uh, Plan International. Honorable Chairperson of the African Commission on Human People's Rights, Honorable Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Plan International. Congratulate the African Commission on Human and People's Rights on the occasion of its 65th ordinary session in Banjul, the Gambia. This forum provides an opportunity for a plan to share progress made towards the realization of improved standards of living for children, particularly girls, and the highlight areas that require the Commission's attention. We are hopeful that the outcome of this meeting will contribute substantively to future deliberations of the African Commission. We are pleased to know that the state periodic reports of the Republic of Chad and the Republic of Zimbabwe will be considered by the Commission during this session. We commit to work closely with the African Commission and other stakeholders, of course, to support these states to implement the recommendations from the from the Commission. Plan also takes steps to work with children and young people to hold these states accountable. Plan International Africa, or in Africa, has just finalized its, fi its five-year advocacy strategy dubbed Connecting the Dots for Girls' Leadership and Agency. The strategy focuses on two thematic areas. One, ending child ma marriage and other harmful traditional practices, including FGM. And two, supporting girls impacted by humanitarian crisis. The strategy also supports youth activism. The thematic er areas were, were selected based on the number of girls and young women who are impacted by the situation, despite specific provisions of the African Children's Charter, the, Mapu the Maputo Protocol, and the Kampala Convention, among, among others. Despite the progress made in ending child marriage and responding to girls affected by humanitarian crisis, a lot still needs to be done to address these issues in terms of policy implementation and resourcing. Honorable Chairperson, as the Commission seeks to deliberate, reflect, and examine human rights situation in, Afri in Africa, Plan would like to draw the Commission's attention to the three following points. One, we reiterate our call to the AU, the Commission, and Member States to resource the Ending Child Marriage Campaign and the strengthen institutions involved in its implementation. We also call on countries that haven't launched the campaign to do so. The 2019 marks the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the AU Convention on the Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons in Africa, and we call on member states to ratify the convention, take steps to allocate resources to provide gender responsive interventions. And finally, we call on the commission, member states and organizations to use gender transformative language in documents and reports and spare out the rights and needs of girls in a situation where girls are disproportionately 
affected. We thank wish you, you fruitful deliberations. Thank you. And we thank you too. <laughs> Kenya Human Rights Commission. Kenya Human Rights Commission. Center for Human Rights. Um, like many CSOs, the Center for Human Rights wishes to acknowledge the great contribution dedication and inspirational leadership of the outgoing chair and vice chair of the commission, Commissioners Maiga and Mute. It also adds its voice to those who congratulate the new chair and vice chair, Commissioners Darso and Lumbu. We wish you uh, very well and pledge our support and cooperation. The center wishes to uh, briefly talk about prioritizing protective, the protective mandate the Commission's protective mandate finalizing communication submitted to it by individuals presents an important avenue through which the Commission can impact on the human rights situation in Africa. The Center is concerned that the Commission has over the last few years increasingly neglected this important aspect of its mandate. In 2017, only one merits decision was concluded. In 2018, only two, and so far in 2019, only one. As a consequence, the backlog of pending cases has increased significantly and the period of delay before communications are finalized has become longer and longer. The center calls on the commission to prioritize the ex execution of its protective mandate, uh, dedicating a unit in its secretariat to addressing the backlog of cases and devoting an adequate period of time during its sessions for communication to communications. To actually impact on the human rights situation, the commission's decisions on communication should be implemented. The center working with the University of Bristol and other partners has just completed the human rights law implementation project uh, study. Um, and from the study, it appears that, the, that publicity and visibility greatly enhance implementation. There is, however, sparse information on the public domain about the implementation of the commission's decisions. It is therefore crucial that the commission provides much more details about the status of implement implementations and decisions. And in order to be able to do so, the Commission should establish a dedicated unit within the Secretariat to ensure follow-up by collecting and analyzing all relevant information. The Commission should also, during its public sessions, on its website, and in its activity reports, provide updated information about the status of implementation. Um, I move to Cameroon. The center um, acknowledges that the human rights conditions in Cameroon remain dire. Uh, although reliable information about the situation is difficult to obtain and verify, there are clear indications that at least some of the violations are intentional and planned by the government security forces. The commission earlier called for a constructive dialogue with the main political actors in order to resolve the constitutional crisis and grievances which would threaten national unity. While the government hosted a grand national dialogue and subsequently released some political prisoners, serious criticism has been directed at the, cent at the nature of the dialogue. Repre representation of the dialogue was biased towards the government. The dialogue did not include relevant non-state armed groups. Several other individuals arrested in connection with the crisis are still behind bars, and the government has not taken any serious steps to generally investigate and prosecute all persons responsible for the violations occasions during the crisis. Importantly, the situation has since then or markedly improved. The time has come to take more concerted action, in particular to involve the AU Peace and Security Council under Articles 19 of the AU Protocol establishing the Peace and Security Council. The Commission shall bring to the to the, to the attention of the PSC any information relevant to the objectives and mandate of the PSC. We urge the Commission to draw the attention of the AU Peace and Security Council to the situation in Cameroon in order to ensure that an ind independent fact-finding mission involves the African Commission, involving the African Commission is actually undertaken and that the AU brokered mediation is, an AU brokered mediation is put in place. Uh, we 
I draw your attention to the soft law standards on intersex persons. The plight of intersex persons in Africa is largely your time unrecognized. Is Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, beg for the indulgence of members of the Commission and delegates for us to uh, listen to two uh, last statements and then we would conclude with that. Uh, thank you very much for your understanding. Uh, we have the institution by the name uh, Al Hatim Adlan. Ah, shukran. Ah, ini lana akum be takikarar makalu hu zemili sabiq min al Sudan. Ah, Sayyid al Rais nuhani akum be takaludo kum mansab al Rais al Mufawad al Afriqi al Hukum al Insan. Wa aydan nashkur. الاتحاد الافريقي ودوله اثيوبيا الفدراليه الديمقراطيه على مجهودهما في وصول الطرفي السودان المتشاكسين المجلس العسكري وقوه الحريه والتغيير الى اتفاق ومن هنا نشكر السيد ممثل الاتحاد الافريقي حسن لبات وكذلك رئيس الوزراء احمد ابي ونهنئه بنيله جائز النوبل للأداء للسلام السودان يمر الآن بمرحلة حرجة حيث ورثت الحكومة الانتقالية خزينة فارقة نتيجة لسياسات النظام القديم ومن ثم كان دخل السودان عقوبات اقتصادية وتحت قائمة الدول الراعية للإرهاب وهذا يحتاج إلى مجهود جبار من الحكومة الانتقالية بمحاسبة خلايا الإرهاب لعناصر النظام القديم الذين لا زالوا يحشدون عناصرهم في المساجد ونشر الفتنة بتكفير الناس والتهديد بالجهاد على خطو على أي خطوة للإصلاح وتحويل نظام الدولة السيوقراطية إلى دولة مدنية السودان في هذه الفترة يحتاج لتضافر جهود الدول الافريقيه ومؤسساتها ممثله في الاتحاد الافريقي والمفوضيه الافريقيه لحقوق الانسان والشعوب بانشاء اليات خاصه بالسودان والمساعده في تمهيد الطريق للفتره الانتقاليه لتسير بسلاسه نحو الديمقراطيه المستدامه. السيد الرئيس في الفتره ما بين يونيو حتى الايام القريبه الفائته وقعت انتهاكات جسيمه في دارفور ضد المدنيين حيث شنت حملات على عدد عدد من القرى مثل مثل مرشين وكدنير وعمليات تعذيب ادت الى الوفاه في نياله واقتصبت ثلاث فتيات قاصرات وكذلك معاناه معاناه المشردين داخليا في معسكرات النزوح اما في كردفان لا زالت الاغتيالات والاعتقالات الجزافيه لم تراوحوا مكانها على على التعدين العشوائي الذي يفتقد لادنى المعايير المطلوبه الأمر الذي أدى إلى كارثة بيئية وتشوهات لأجنة النساء الحوامل وموت الثروة الحيوانية. آه يطالب مركز الخاتم عدلان والمنظمات المتضامنة الآتي: نناشد الاتحاد الإفريقي بمواصلة مجهوداته في تقديم المساعدة الفنية للحكومة الانتقالية، وذلك بإنشاء مكتب بالخرطوم لمواصلة عملية بناء المؤسسات الحكومية وخاصة السلطة القضائية. التي تفتقد لأدنى معايير الاستقلالية والولائية وبناء عملية السلام نناشد المفوضية الإفريقية بإرسال بحث تقصي حقائق حول انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان في الفترة ما بعد قيام الثورة والتحقق من الانتهاكات في مناطق الحرب في دارفور والنيل الأزرق وجبال النوبة نناشد الحكومة الانتقالية بشقها المجلس السيادي ومجلس الوزراء على إكمال بناء مؤسسات مستقلة تراعي المكونات السودانية دون تمييز على أي أساس نحس الحكومة على تسليم مجرمي الحرب المطلوبين للعدالة الدولية مع السماح للمدعي العام للمحكمة الجنائية الدولية من تتبع التحريات التي لم تكتمل بعد 
بشان اشخاص ارتكبوا جرائم حرب بعد قائمه المطلوبين في المرحله الاولى ندعو الحكومه الانتقاليه على ارساد عائم السلام في كل ارجاء السودان وتفعيل عمليه العداله الانتقاليه لابراء الجراحات ومعالجة كل المظالم التاريخية نناشد الحكومة السودانية بالمصادقة على جميع الاتفاقيات الدولية والإقليمية والبروتوكولات الملحقة بها التي لم يصادق عليها السودان شكرا جزيلا Thank you um, A representative of uh, somebody by the name Malin Sohai Kombati Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Uh, Mr. Chairperson of the African Commission on Humans and People's Rights, Honorable Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Uh, my name is Afabakari Bissise. Uh, I'm representing the West African Human Rights D D Defenders Network. Uh, giving the speak uh, on behalf of Melanie C C C Combatant. The West African Human Rights Defenders Network warmly thanks uh, Mr. M Mrs. Soyata Maiga, outgoing chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People Rights, for the service rendered to the continent and congratulate the new chairperson of the Commission, Honorable Solomon A. Dasso. We welcome the abrogation of law on criminal and seditious defamation by the state of Sierra Leone, a law which has been in place since 1965, which was meant to suppress the freedom of the press. The network is asking for the Commission to adopt recommendations for the following West African states. The state of Guinea Conakry to immediately release all human rights defenders that are currently in, in detention, namely Abrahman Sano, Seku Kondono, Ibrahim Ajalo, by law destined in men and build the sum, as well as all those arrested in connection with the demonstration of 14th October 2019. To open and conduct an investigation to establish the cause of death during this demonstration. To protect the civil space for better expression and manifestation of all the rights. To also call on uh, the state of Nigeria to create civil space for all civil society activities and make sure that human, human rights defenders are all safe in the implementation and advocacy of their work. Also to work, to call on the state of Togo to also create civil space uh, as far as election is concerned, to give space for freedom of expression and freedom of assembly in Africa as enshrined in uh, the Charter of the African Commission on Human and People Rights. I thank you all. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, statement. Uh, the final, very final one is Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, State Delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights presents this statement um, following, following the last update presented during the 64th session, the human rights situation in Zimbabwe remains precarious. The economic situation is dire with prices of basic commodities beyond the reach of many citizens. The rights to freedom of association, assembly, and to peacefully demonstrate continue to be trampled upon with those suspected for organizing demonstrations to push the government to address the economic situation being abducted by unknown people. Social economic rights. The country is going through its worst economic crisis in a decade that is fast approaching the hyperinflation horror of uh, 2008, which decimated both lives and the local currents. The health sector. The decay of the Zimbabwean economy is perhaps best reflected by its collapsing health delivery system. Zimbabwe's health sector is mired in a crisis as public hospital doctors are on strike and have been 
So for a long period of time with no solution in sight. This job action has resulted in patients being turned away from hospitals while there have been widespread reports of deaths in circumstances which could have been prevented had patients received adequate care. Doctors are demanding better salaries and allowances as well as better conditions of service from the state. Unfortunately, um, this has not been prioritized to deal with crisis in the health sector. The education, the government of Zimbabwe has failed to properly remunerate teachers, leading to teachers declaring incapacitation to attend to work. This has negatively impacted the rights of children to learn as teachers are, suspending, are spending more time out of classrooms supplementing their income civil and political rights, the right to freedom of association, assembly, and to peacefully demonstrate continue to be under siege with the police prohibiting opposition uh, demonstrations which were planned for the 16th of August 2019. During the period running from the 16th of August uh, 2019, six people suspected to be involved in the planning of the demonstrations were abducted and tortured by known people and left for dead. As Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights therefore urges the Commission to call upon the government of Zimbabwe to take all measures necessary to guarantee the security of everyone, including those people regarded as critical to government policies, adopt measures to demilitarize the state institutions, to hold perpetrators of extrajudicial executions accountable, to provide adequate funding towards solving the perennial water challenges in the country, including funding for health and education sector, to guarantee political rights of citizens, and create an environment in which rights to assembly, expression, and association are promoted, to provide adequate resources and guarantee the independence of institutions supporting democracy and finally to fully align all laws with the Constitution and reform institutions for them to efficiently and effectively discharge their constitutional mandate I thank you thank you uh, Zimbabwe lawyer for human rights uh, for uh, drawing the attention of the Commission and participants to the impact that the economic crisis in Zimbabwe is having uh, on uh, the provision of social services, including health and uh, education, um, and also the issues that you have highlighted relating to freedom of assembly and, and association. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the Commission, uh, delegates of states, NHRIs, and Cameroon is asking for the floor. So it is Cameroon that's standing between you and the lunch. Cameroon, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we want to exercise this uh, right of reply. We listen keenly to the Center for Human Rights of the University of Pretoria, uh, indicating that the major dialogue, national dialogue held in our country was not sufficiently representative but we want to differ here because this is not true. We, we said earlier that um, in the during the national dialogue, lawyers were available, teachers were available, civil society actors were available, political leaders were there, religious leaders, traditional authorities, syndicates, student unions, uh, independent personalities, ex-combatants were there, and uh, two-thirds of the persons who attended this, uh, this meeting were from the Northwest and Southwest and 5% from the diaspora. We want to equally say here that the government is taking action to prosecute authors of violation of human rights in our, in our country. Uh, we therefore do not accept the figures that are coming. Contrary to what uh, some speakers have been saying that the violations of human rights is intentional. This too is not true as the state is taking measures in capacity building of its defense and security forces uh, in this area in the respect of human rights. To combat impunity of those violating uh, human rights, the state is investigating and prosecuting. And for instance, we are giving, we are saying here that about 42 uh, officers are under prosecution within five military courts for violations of human rights committed in the country within the framework of the situation that is going on in our country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cameroon. Um, 
As uh, I was saying, uh, I would like to thank members of the Commission. Okay, again, uh, Zimbabwe exercising a right of reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, we took a position from day one that as we are going to report uh, during this 65th ordinary session, we are going to respond to most of the allegations that have been labeled against us during that time. So in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've just raised our flag to uh, register to you that much as we are not in agreement with the allegations, but we shall find time during the time of our report to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Zimbabwe. Um, we have now come to the end of uh, our session uh, for today. Uh, uh, and all that is left for me to say is to thank all of you for your patience, uh, including uh, our colleagues in the booth, uh, interpreters, and to wish you uh, a happy uh, good afternoon and also uh, bon appetit. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretariat had an announcement to make. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is an announcement. There will be um, at 1640 a side event. It's called the, Propo the African Union Working Group on Safety of Journalists in Africa would hold a side event today at 1630 to 1830 in this conference hall. You are all invited to attend. Thank you.